Welcome to the Ultra Origins series, where we hear from runners who have recently finished their first ultra or completed a new distance. In these conversations, we celebrate regular people who are doing hard things. I think there's a lot we can learn and be inspired by from people just like you. In this episode, we meet Elliot Walduck from North Dakota. Elliot is a fan of the channel, and I happened to meet him while I was volunteering at the 2023 Crazy Mountain 100 in Montana. Elliot ran his first 50K in 2020, and in the short time following has racked up several ultra finishes, all with the goal to eventually tackle the 200 mile distance. This year, Elliot achieved his goal and finished not only the Cocodona 250, but also the Tahoe 200. Why don't you just start off by introducing yourself to us and then maybe tell us a little bit about how you got started into running and then we can learn about your ultra journey and then especially talk about the big leap you took earlier this year. Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, my name is Elliot Waldock. I've been, I did my first ultra in February of 2020. It was a 50K, a friend of mine in, it was late, later 2019, we just, I was just browsing the internet and looking for something to do that sounded hard and challenging. And it came up, I really strongly disliked running when I was younger. Uh -huh. I played sports in high school. I played football for four years. I absolutely dreaded running in practice. It was absolute torture. You could ask anybody that I played with. That was, <laughs> it, it was not fun, not enjoyable. We did it a lot. And I guess just later in life, later 20s, I got back into fitness. I didn't really do anything in my early 20s. Uh, gained the, the freshman 25 mm -hmm. in college yeah. and just wasn't really active at all. And I got back into calisthenics. I was just doing that for fitness. That was going great. I lost about 20 pounds. Was just looking for something new that was challenging and came across ultra running and I thought, man, I really hate running. This sounds like a great way to just make like this big pivot. So basically just did the uh, the couch to ultra running, had no idea what I was doing, didn't know really anything about it, didn't have the resources. I wasn't looking on Reddit or to get pointers. It was just a wing it type thing. So the funny thing about that was the the farthest I had run continuously was it couldn't have been more than a couple of miles. So I built up from there. I distinctly remember the first time I ran a 5k and didn't stop. Like I, I just ran a continuous 5k and that was just a breakthrough. I was yeah. like, oh, that was a long ways. And it is people say now to me at work or just friends that's, man, I can't, I can't run that far or they do something like that, like a 5k or a 10k like, dude, that's a long ways. It, it is a long ways. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, kudos to anybody mm -hmm. that gets out there and, you know, at whatever pace you're at, I mean, mine were, uh, I don't even know how fast I was going, not very fast, but it was that gradual buildup. I ran a 5K, and then the next day I ran a 5K, and the next day I ran a 5K, and I was like, wow, this is like, this is really something it's we're, easier. we're building here. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the buildup, I still wasn't, I hadn't surpassed much over a 5K, leading, getting closer to that first 50K, and that was in February. I live in North Dakota. So it's really cold in the winter. It's hard to get out and be super active. Uh, thankfully, that year, it was fairly mild in January. So I was getting out and getting miles in. Okay. And this is going to not knowing anything about training, tapering. Didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. Still really don't know what that is. <laughs> The I figured I haven't ran far ever, and in a couple weeks here, shortly, I'm going to be running one mile, so I should probably see what that feels like. The weekend before the 50K, I thought, I'm going to run to town and home from the farm, and that's about 10 miles, so it was about a 20 mile out and back. Okay. And I had my, I had a couple of cliff bars and a bottle of water. And it was a pretty nice winter day here, North Dakota wise. 
and I took off and I made it, I was probably seven miles in or something. And I thought this is super hard. I didn't know the whole ultra walking thing. Mm -hmm. I was just running. I ran and I was, this is really hard. So then I did the walk run thing and I finished it. I made it to town and I made it home and I thought that was excruciating. That was really hard. And I got to go 11 miles farther than that here in a week. So, you know, if you're just starting out, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do your taper super sore. Cause we went down to Arizona for that 50 K and I was still feeling the residual effects mm -hmm. of that 20 miler that I had just done. But the, that gave me the mental marker in my head that you can do hard stuff you're not you you survived you made it the the 50k it it was great started to i knew i was way way out of my element when we showed up there i had a nathan handheld that was it i didn't know those were a thing mm -hmm. so i saw people with i'm like wow they got some capacity here it was two 15 ish mile loops with a couple aid stations scattered out so i just thought oh i can make my way to the aid stations resupply yeah and continue and and get it done and it was uh it, it was a rude awakening it was it was very hard i still think probably to date that was probably the hardest ultra that i've done mm -hmm. just from a mental and physical honestly i was pretty i was pretty battered after that was a high volume week for me if you want to count the 20 miles yeah. i did the weekend previous saturday to saturday it was 50 miles so that was a, a lot of volume for me i finished it i got it done i what really stuck with me and what has stuck in the years since and the races since is just the people that you meet mm. at the races that's far and away the best part of ultra running for me is the community just the type of people that you meet I've met some people in passing or we ran together for a mile, 10 miles, something like that. And I would consider them lifelong friends. We text, we talk, we're friends on social media. We exchange messages. We yeah. keep up with each other and what we're doing. And I think that's probably just the greatest thing ever. Ultra, the ultra community is full of just the best people out there. And I think going down to the the bottom of the well mentally emotionally physically that kind of brings out it can bring out the absolute best in you and in other people yep. and through that it lifts you up so it allows you to lift others up and yeah that after i got a taste of that i had a couple of masters age runners that i was running with mm -hmm. that they were oh yeah this is just me this is my first run of the year I was just hanging out, eating McDonald's all winter, and this is just a training run for me. And I'm like, this is a this is a massive undertaking for me. I don't know if I'm gonna survive this. They helped me. I had a woman give me some salt pills when I was could have been withering away out in the desert. <laughs> and that I'm like, wow, that was that she didn't have to do that. Since then, I've been on the other side of that. I've ran into people that are there. I'm out there running a race and they're out there. Oh yeah, this is my first ultra or this is my first hundred or this is my first 200 and I don't really know what to expect. And I'm like, yeah, it's it. the journey kind of is what you make of it. But I've offered assistance, given water to people or whatever, done the, the whole trail angel thing. And yeah, that going over to the volunteering side of things or the crewing, crewing someone or pacing someone or doing that, the whole environment of ultra running, it just stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And immediately after finishing that 50K, I was like, yeah, I got to do this again. I couldn't walk for a long time. Sure. I couldn't run for six weeks. I tried and it just, my legs were just lead. And yeah, I signed up for uh, a bunch of 50Ks, I think probably 100K too, but then that was 2020. A few weeks later, everything happened, it all shut down. Right. So I ended up just continuing training and doing a bunch of virtual 50Ks. I did all summer long, I did a handful of timed events, 50Ks, stuff like that, and then just built from that and then just made the, the gradual progression. I think I went from the 50Ks and then I did a 50 miler, 100K, maybe a couple of those, and then made the leap up to the 100 milers and then just went from there. How long did it take you from deciding you're going to run a 50K 
to then actually running that 50K? Like how long did you give yourself to train off the couch and get yourself as ready as you're going to be for your first time at a 50K distance? I would have to look at the registration history, but no more than three months. Oh, okay, so a pretty short amount of time to go from zero yeah, to 50K. I, and I mean, in the first, call it half of the time leading up to that 50K, I wasn't following like a structure or yeah. anything. And even to, to this day, I'm not a super structured runner. Mm. I run off feel a lot just going by what i feel like doing mm -hmm. i do i've i've implemented a lot more strength training in the last two years that's made a big difference just that kind of protecting protecting my joints and yeah. ligaments having maybe a little bit more muscle has it's definitely benefited me so i think from a a beginner standpoint i would i would recommend implementing a little bit of both make sure you're getting your miles in because there really isn't a substitute for that for the the strain it's a you, you call it you can call it what you want but it is an impact sport you're beating up your joints you're if you're hammering your downhills you're gonna you're gonna know that's right and if if your quads are lacking it's it the race are doing it might punch above its weight a little bit <laughs> later on yeah. i found that out firsthand i've done the i've done the the killian downhill thing early on and paid for it later <laughs> so I, I i don't do that much anymore so <laughs> not during races anyways did you you so because you do running by feel was there something that you were feeling that led you to the decision that you needed to implement some strength training into your training schedule i think i would say the perceived effort it was higher i just felt more fatigued later on in the races hmm. where if it were either maybe either less gain or just if i was probably just running slower if i was running within my abilities it wouldn't have been as noticeable but i think just from adding in strength training i can really notice it if you're doing a if you're doing a big event with a substantial amount of gain i think it would behoove you to to definitely implement some strength training i'm not really doing anything crazy i'm doing a lot of isometric stuff kettlebell single leg a lot of bulgarian split squats oh, things okay. like that yeah. step ups yeah i just did my workout here after work and it was just ton of step ups and uh, lunges and stuff like that so you don't have to do anything crazy the olympic lifts are fine but you don't i don't think you need to do anything super out of the box i i only have a couple kettlebells and some dumbbells and stuff and a, a, a box and that's that that works for me and just that little bit if you're doing it 30 minutes a day or something like that like it's made quite a difference yeah. i've noticed it here this year or the, the race where I met you, Crazy Mountain, that had quite a bit of gain in that 100 miles. And I met you towards the end of the race, and it was, it was, I was happy with my decision to implement strength training. Yeah, put it really that smart. Way. Yeah, you're right. You don't have to have giant racks of huge weights. Your own body weight is often sufficient, but doing a lot of that single leg stuff like you're describing is really beneficial to your body because as you're running, you're constantly on one leg or the other. Yeah, you're on one or the other, so yeah. I think it, it will... It'll really, it'll really highlight those imbalances mm -hmm. and that in turn, if you can strengthen the other side, it'll protect you because you're constantly looking at the ground and, you know, your footing isn't, we're not running on a track. You, you can do ultras on a track, but I mean, if you're out in the mountains, you know, you got to be conscious of what you're doing and, you know, your foot placement's important. So it's like you're it's not just your mind that's firing constantly to think about it. You have to be, you, your body has to be pretty in tune too. So you're, yeah, you're just training, training in a more purposeful way, mm -hmm. I guess I would put it yeah. as opposed to if you were just training for like aesthetics or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you went off, so you've had a successful first 50 K you finished it hurt afterwards and then you moved on to some other distances. What is what that led you to the decision to go to the next major step up, which maybe people would consider a hundred miler. Cause I think 
that's a big that's a big commitment to decide you're going to go that far. What was your what was the kind of thought process for wanting to jump? Well, the the main thing was I finished that first 50k and then Jim Walmsley was at that 50k. Oh, really? It was I didn't know who he was. Yeah. He it was uh incredible to see and after that I hopped on Spotify and I was listening to some podcasts. We were hanging out in Phoenix after and you know, who is this guy? Just started to learn and then that was just the the mind opening eye opening thing that this is a it's a huge thing. We got all sorts of distances. There's people that can do twice the distance that I did in the same amount of time. And it's just this mind blowing thing. Mm -hmm. So then I hopped on YouTube and that's where I found your channel because shortly thereafter that you had your Moab video come out mm -hmm. and the whole realm of what I would call extreme distances, not to say that a 50 K is not extreme because it, it is honestly, but 200 miles and I'm like wow that's just that sounds pretty incredible and I was just enthralled with the idea of going on an adventure mm -hmm. and being out doing a task or having a goal that what's going to take you days to complete mm -hmm. I thought that was the coolest thing ever so basically from the get-go I was having my eye on running 200 miles oh, okay. so that was that that allowed me to wake up in the morning with a dream or a goal that every day if you're trying to get a little bit better you're building these blocks and what what i call it is like the aggregation of marginalized gains to where you're just doing a little bit but you have that big mountain at the end that goal and if that's a 100k or a 100 miler or a 200 miler or whatever that is if you have a plan and i wasn't going to fool myself into thinking that i could just go to that mm -hmm. let's just start jumping in the lottery and see what happens i did start jumping in the lottery sooner than maybe I should have. But yeah, that sort of was like, okay, what's the, I went through the call it a logical progression to where I just built through distances. And then eventually I reached, that was in December of, I think it was 2021 that I ran my first hundred. I think I believe that was at Brazos yeah, Bend. Was, Brazos Ben 100, yeah, that was in December of 2021. It was a 18-ish uh, months, a year and a half after I had started. Yeah, okay. To where I made that step up to the to the hundred mile distance, and again, that one was it was insanely challenging. It was really hard, and I finished, and I was hobbled and humbled, and just seeing people out there gritting it out and gutting it out, and I was one of them. And I had my lofty time goal, which I fell way short of. It's a super flat course. I somehow twisted my ankle and fought through that. But one of the volunteers, she said, wow, you look like you're not moving that great. And she said, hey, hang on a minute. She ran to her car. Here, take these. And she gave me her trekking poles. And wow. trekking poles on a race that has a cumulative gain of a couple hundred feet is laughable. Yeah. But having that four-wheel drive of the poles mm -hmm. with one bad ankle, did it get me across the finish line? Maybe. I was only two and a half, three hours ahead of cutoff, so who's to say? But that was just another one of those instances of somebody that just was like, hey, man, anything I can do to help anybody out there. Yeah. And yeah, got to the end of that. And then I just thought, yeah, we got to keep keep it rolling. It feels good when you can accomplish a goal. You put a plan together and if you can execute and feel satisfied with your results based on the amount of work that you're able to do. Mm -hmm. Um I am really busy, so it's not feasible for me to devote 20 hours a week to this dream. Mm. So I'm working with the time that I have available. And if that means waking up at 5 a.m. to get my lift in and then running in the evening or doing whatever I need to do to make that work, that's where I'm at with yeah. that. And I think that's maybe important to 
compartmentalize is if you're working a job or two jobs or you have a lot of events going on with your children or any other events that you got going on in your life, but you can be kind to yourself and honest with yourself that I'm not a professional athlete that can train for eight hours a day mm -hmm. or I you have time to do two long runs a day or or what I would categorize as a long run or something like that but yeah I lean towards that I'm just a regular guy that I really enjoy doing these events and I'm doing as much as I can with the time that I have and trying to maximize my enjoyment more so I'm I'm happy I'm happy when things go well I'm really happy when I can finish a race and not be injured or in a lot of pain yeah it's it's a gradual progression I think you can I always have every race that I've done has been my a race it's time off from work it's time away from family it's travel time it's travel expenses nothing I'm not getting entry into these for free right. and I'm not winning a golden ticket to get into western states or something like that mm -hmm. so it's i'm we're bootstrapping it i'm driving to a lot of these races i'm sleeping in my car it's that adds to the experience for me and that adds the challenge too because that i get that question a lot is why why do you do it isn't it isn't a marathon far enough and it's i like challenging myself i like doing difficult things and it's hard to find uh, a cool race that's not an ultra in my opinion <laughs> once we can get out and see things that you would never see if you weren't going out there on foot that's also part of the allure for me is just that whole the whole idea of going on an adventure well you started to get you got pretty good at the 100 milers it looks like because you finished that first one in, in december of 21 and then did a few more quite a few more after that i think uh, by the time I met you last year, it might have been like your sixth or seventh 100 mile yeah, or something like that. Somewhere in there, it was just that snowball effect. There there was a bundle. They called it the the flyover slam. It okay. was 400 milers in flyover states. So that was the, the Hawk 100 in Lawrence, Kansas. And then the Mines of Spain in Dubuque, Iowa the Hitchcock experience that was also in Iowa and then that culminated with the Outlaw 100 and that was in Oklahoma okay. and that was all it was a slam so they were bundled into the first one would have been in September then there was one in October November and then the following February oh, so okay. they were condensed yeah. so that was just that maybe my thinking was that like hey if I can do if I can do these with a limited amount of rest and recovery in between, see how this goes. Maybe I am ready to make that jump to the 200s. Okay. So that was where I thought, hey, if we can get through this, then maybe I am ready to make that, that next jump. So that, that was my goal was to complete those, finish them, and then, yeah, then take it from there. It, uh, it worked out, and then... I put in for the Tahoe 200 lottery and I was drawn and that was uh, last year, but they had the snow deferral for all that snow that they had there and they ended up moving it to the week before the Crazy Mountain 100 and I knew that I wouldn't be able to do that. I think I would have been setting myself up for failure to try to do the Tahoe 200 and then the following week go out to Montana and do the Crazy Mountain 100. So they offered the free deferral. So that was why I deferred that to here this summer. But then they did that after I had already signed up for Cocodona. Oh. So that was how I got roped into doing the two here this oh, okay. summer. So, so that you was... Sorry, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to interrupt you. So you, it feels like your plan of using your hundreds and all your incremental improvements to build up to having the confidence of doing 200 eventually succeeded because you, like you say, you you signed up for the Tahoe 200 for last year. Was your plan last year had it been to do Tahoe and Crazy Mountain at it would have that would have been six weeks apart or something like that? Was that right? Yep. 
Yeah, and and I fully intended to follow oh, okay. through with that. That would have been it, it. Would have been a challenge, but I would have attempted it sure. for sure. Okay. So, uh, I ended up utilizing the fitness that I was building because I had a really good block. Like I thought I, I that was some good fitness that I had last summer. So what I ended up doing was out here in North Dakota, we have what's called the the Matahe Trail, which is a hundred and fifty five mile point-to-point single track trail in the badlands of north dakota cool i did that i did the whole bad the whole mata 150 that same weekend that i would have done tahoe oh, okay that there it's not on ultra sign up it's it does it self I, they have an event for it but it's a kind of do it on your own okay. type thing the uh, Save the Matahe Foundation is uh, a nonprofit where all of the proceeds from all the races that they put on, it all gets put back into the trail. So it's all through volunteer work that keeps up on that trail. So every summer, it by hand is it's mowed by volunteers, and it's it's a really great it's an awesome place. It's my favorite spot out here in North Dakota. And yeah, if you ever if you ever want to come out, it's it's a great place to run. But yeah, I did that with, with my good friend Harrison. He comes with me to a lot of my races. He was with me there at Cocodona and Crazy Mountain. He crews me, paces me, does whatever he can. That's but awesome. he crewed me for that. And yeah, it's it was just all on your own. You can start whenever you want and just go. You can take as long as you would like to do it. But yeah, I ended up doing that. It took me a little over 53 hours i think to do the trail wow. and that was it, it was a good it was a good confidence booster mm -hmm. i thought wow that was a long ways when i finished i said there's absolutely no way i could turn around and run back 50 miles right now i was like <laughs> that it just wouldn't happen i would make it maybe back up to the top and that would be it i knew i had work to do i was able to carry that confidence when in did crazy mountain and then it was the build for cocodona yeah. i guess here this this past may so that was the sole focus after that it was just let's get as ready as i possibly can and try something new and not just cocodona i mean it's it's so wild to think about your history you're starting getting interested in all this you want to someday do a 200 you're working your way through the 50ks and the 50 mile so now when you're in the year that you're going to finally you know i guess achieve your goal of getting into a 200 mile race you've ended up in a situation where you're going to do two of them uh, basically back to back one at the beginning of may and now the, the next one in mid-june i mean that you jumped into the deep end yeah and i can say pretty confidently that i don't think i yet have the physiological adaptations to do that i would at this point in my young running career the doing the grand slam or doing the triple crown or the uh, whatever they're gonna call the monster Cocodona yes. thing. <laughs> yeah. That that frightens me a lot. Mm. I think would, I think I would need to really hone in on the 200 distance and do, or just be extremely purposeful about what I'm doing constantly for me where I'm at right now. In, in five years, I think I'll probably feel different about that. I, I honestly, think if I can continue staying relatively injury free and enjoying training, I, I have fun when I'm training. So that's important to me Sure. where it's not my job. I enjoy training for these things so that I can enjoy them when I go do them. And as long as that's still there, I think I, yeah, someday would definitely love to do the triple crown or the grand slam or by that point i don't know how many 200s we're gonna have there'll be there there's more popping up every year so it's becoming a quite popular distance did you do much different in your training schedule or was it just building on the history that you had been doing until now in terms of getting ready for your first 200 like when you were now cocodona is the next thing on your schedule was there anything different about the way that you were training for that i think frequency and intensity mm -hmm. went up okay i don't think I wasn't necessarily running m more. I was implementing more speed work. I would I did about for that for Cocodona. I was doing two two speed days a week, which was just intervals, hill sprints, things like that. But I 
literally haven't done that ever. Mm. Like I wasn't ever doing that. And then I think from December until I started tapering for Cocodona, I was in the gym Monday to Friday. Okay. From December until then, and I never missed a day. I thought if I was in bed not training, it's like you're just robbing yourself hmm. or you're going to you're going to have to you're robbing Peter to pay Paul or whatever you want to say it. You'll pay for it later. So it's that was all the motivation that I needed hmm. where, you know, I don't necessarily struggle with the motivation part because I don't really know that the motivation plays into it a whole lot. But you, you can't I don't think you can stay motivated all the time. It feels awesome when you click yes on ultra sign up and then the, your name's popped up on the entrance list, that feels great. But it's that's if you're signed up for a race that's in 12 months or 10 months or six months or whatever the time is, it's that's that's going to fizzle out and go away. So it's like, if you have the discipline, I think that probably it supersedes a lot of the, the feel good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, if you've got it set, do whatever you need to do. Send yourself those automated emails or add it to whatever you need to do to have a an app or something like that to get you out of bed or to get you doing what you need to do to accomplish your goals. Because I think you can't be disappointed in the results that you don't get that you wanted if you didn't do the work to get it. That's right. Which is where I fall in it's i'm i'm i was realistic i wasn't going to complete cocodona in 80 hours i it's that's my fitness isn't there i don't have the ability to do that right now mm -hmm. would that be awesome to be there someday sure i think i'm actually the next time i do cocodona the the sub 96 i think is that's where i would like to fall in i think that would be my I've hit the distance, so then the next logical progression is to maybe just do it a little bit quicker. So that's if you can implement the training and execute and do your part, it's because it's on you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. No one's, I, I don't have a coach, so it's no one's in my ear telling me to, hey, get out the door and put, yeah. your, put your shoes on and go for a run. Like, I, I got to be that for myself. So well, how did Cocodona go for you? So it's a big it's a big jump from 100 miles to 200 miles. It's it's, it's yeah. not just double or in care. No, it's not even the same thing. Yeah. It really isn't. You you factor in sleep and uh, your prob dietary things. For someone like me is way different. I'm not out there completing it sub 60. I'm not doing it on gels and <laughs> stuff like that. You're adding in a lot more meals during the thing. So I had an awesome time. It was it was an absolutely uh, you know horrible brutal event but it was an absolutely awesome amazing experience yeah. everything about it was great i hit multiple lows i had moments where i cried maybe three times during the race and it's what are we doing it's just <laughs> this is so hard i have a hundred plus miles to go or i've got 80 plus miles to go or whatever or i've got to climb mount eldon now right. and yeah it was uh it was definitely far removed from anything that I had done prior and I don't really know what a person would do to prepare for that other mm. than do it. I think it's like if you believe in yourself and you think that you can do it, I don't think there's anything wrong with signing up and trying it. I ran with a woman. We were together through the Granite Dells and that was her second ultra and wow. her previous distance it was sub it was sub 100 miles i mm -hmm. can't remember if it was 50k or 50 miles or 100k but i mean it was sub 100 miles and she was just going for it right. and if you're within your if you can stay within your realm of ability we're not out there trying to pr a half marathon or whatever if you can train for what you're doing and stay mentally in it, I think that that can do a lot for you. I think stealing your mind and being prepared for the hardships that you're going to endure, I think that's big because if you're, if you're not in it mentally, then I think the body is soon to follow. Sure. If you, if you start to 
hit those lows and there's nothing in the back of your mind that can pull you out of it. Or if you're alone, hats off to anybody that's out there doing Cocodona or Tahoe or any of those huge events without a crew. You don't have you don't have that little carrot mm-hmm. for you. Let's hey, I get to see my crew at the aid station. So it's only eight miles. That's only gonna take me a couple hours to get there. And then I can see some friends or family or whatever that is. Those little things for me, those are huge. I know that at Cocodona, my brother and sister they flew out to arizona my brother lives in canada and my sister lives in colorado and they both came down that my brother was there on thursday morning in sedona okay so i got to see him at was about five o'clock in the morning when i rolled into sedona and that right there like that propelled me into the whole next day to where i'm like Mm. that was great that he would take time off work and do this for me like that that that's huge if you have somebody like that for you that it's it can be a difference maker for sure i maybe got off track there a little bit on the coca dona thing but (laughs) yeah i think the the whole experience was it was pretty amazing i'm on the wait list for next year so i did i thought about it right away and I know they opened registration. I can't remember if it was day two or day one of the race. It was pretty early. I know we were out there on the course when people were saying I think it was day the... one because I met a guy, a volunteer at Crown King. And he told sure. me he has signed up for the, the race already. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. Is it, we yeah. we, we yeah. haven't even finished day one yet. And they've already opened yeah, it. Yeah, that's there. And it, and it was sold out quick. Yep. I didn't. And by that time, I think once once it was sold out, the wait list just exploded. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I waited for maybe a day or two and I'm 200 oh on the wait list. And if it, if it doesn't happen, if there isn't, I've moved up on the wait list, but if there isn't enough movement and I can't get into it next year, I'll probably be there in 26. Yeah. I'll be one of those guys that's watching the live stream. And then I'll just, I'll be the guy that poaches a spot right away. So, so yeah, how did think- your recovery from your first sort of, because I want to get to Tahoe next. Cause that's, yeah. I'm still, amazed at how once you finally got into the 200 world how you did two of them so close to each other so how did your recovery go after finishing Cocodona? and then i'm curious to know then how that led into and what learnings you had from Cocodona experience to go in towards into tahoe yeah i definitely felt like the recovery was i i did the best that i could i prioritized sleep i slept Smart. a lot i'm not a big sleeper that adding in a couple hours a night, making sure that I'm trying to shut her down by nine o'clock, at least be laying in bed by nine, mm-hmm. that makes a big difference. The just sleeping was was great. It it is really remarkable that what the body can do, though. Mm-hmm. Where I think it that that's been my findings is just the adaptation of as you stack these races and you start doing longer events just the body's ability to adapt to that yep. and just go into a hyper recovery mode where if you're getting your nutrition i i prioritize protein i'm i was trying to hit my 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 macro goal on protein specifically every single day after the race and sleeping a lot i ran very little in between Cocodona and tahoe the longest run I went on was five miles. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And uh, was I was getting my steps in. I walk my day job. I'm not at my desk very much. I'm out in the field a lot. So I'm getting a lot of steps in during the day. And then I was back in the gym pretty quickly after where I thought in my head was let's minimize the impact force mm-hmm. on my body and just work on rebuilding the body as much as possible before you have to break it all down again at Tahoe because it was pretty quick yeah. after. So I had to, again, be realistic about where I was at in, in my journey as a runner and just leading into Tahoe and approaching it. I was feeling good physically. I was not dealing with anything odd. I didn't feel weird. I felt pretty good in my skin. It was like taking off a couple days before the race started you know i drove to i drove out to to state line from home here in north dakota and 
I got out there and I'm like, yeah, I think we're ready. <laughs> I guess we'll find out tomorrow. And yeah, then here a couple weeks ago, that, that race kicked off. And yeah, it was extremely challenging with the, I think, residual effects of Cocodona. I felt it day one. I likened it to when I attempted to do all those hundreds, mm -hmm. which to me were back to back where they were within, within weeks of each other. other. Yeah. I, I could feel the fatigue in my legs where I just didn't feel like I had a lot of pop. I would be trying to get up a climb on day one and just the perceived effort was higher i'm just thinking i'm going slower than i feel like i should be for as hard as i'm pushing yeah. as as hard as i'm not running up this hill but i feel like my power hiking should be carrying me a little bit faster than it is right now mm -hmm. and that took about two days of tahoe to where I started to feel like my legs got under me and I was maybe moving a little bit better. Oh, okay. I don't really know the correlation. I, there was definitely the not being 100%. I didn't have feelings like that at Cocodona where, you know, just feeling weak or just no, no explosiveness there where I remember a couple of climbs later in Cocodona where I felt like I... I zipped up them pretty quickly mm. and get you get to the top of Kasner Canyon and I felt like I went up that really well and then you're off on the roads after that and felt great and I didn't really have any experiences like that at Tahoe oh, okay. to where I'm like oh yeah like we're you know firing on all cylinders uh, I just I, I had to deal with it and I did develop uh, day day three heading into Tahoe City for the turnaround. I developed just a flare up in my patellar tendon in my right knee. Oh, okay. And I was experiencing, I would consider it like a high level of discomfort. Mm -hmm. I think that I would say was, I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any thoughts of quitting, but I was concerned that if it got worse than it was, that it could potentially take me out mm. to where I would not want to be off the course willingly, but if I wasn't moving fast enough that I, I could end up getting timed out, yeah. which I think for as well as I was doing, respective to me, I think if I had to, I probably could have walked it in time-wise. I, I would have had time to finish on Tuesday. But just the thought of 70 miles with a lot of pain in my knee, I think that was, it was concerning to me. Sure. But kudos to the the medics there at Tahoe City. He, I sat down in the chair and he looked at my knee and he like poked it and I just, ow. Oh yeah, right there. It's like super swollen. So he did a really good job with the KT tape. He put like a saddle below it and then did like a crisscross with the KT tape to lift on it. Yeah. And that plus some words of encouragement from my friends and crew and a couple of painkillers and an energy drink. And I took <laughs> off and it honestly felt pretty good for the rest of the race. I oh, think it great. was the last, that last 18 mile section, I think was where... It was getting towards the end of the race and I was feeling it and I was like, yeah, it's, it's there. But, uh, at that point you're, you know, you're 18 miles from the finish. So it's like, nothing was going to stop me from getting there. Yeah. So that, um, yeah, that one, it, it, it was pretty hard fought. I think the, I, I had, uh, struggles like the, the Tahoe lung that everybody gets, mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty violent. I would say just as far as the coughing goes, maybe, I could definitely feel the elevation. I'm in North Dakota, so we're 2,000 feet of elevation, spending all that time up there. I could definitely feel it. It was also something that was in the back of my mind for the perceived effort mm -hmm. to where I thought maybe it's not just the fact that I'm wore out from Cocodona. Maybe it's the fact that my lungs aren't at working at maximum efficiency and I'm not oxygenating my blood enough because it's I'm not used to being up this high for this long. I had a couple bloody noses that happens 
to me all the time at the races where you're getting all the dust and stuff in there mm. so that yeah and then just the the longer the longer intervals between seeing your crew that was a big challenge too those self-sufficiency is key in those races of candaces which i can i can surmise that from watching your videos and looking at course profiles and stuff is that was that was an really awesome part for me at Cocodona where I could get a little break here and there where you get some it's only 10 miles or right. it's only however many miles it's not like, oh yeah that section was 18 like now turn around and run it again that was the the Tahoe experience so. yeah the destination trail races sometimes mean you don't get to see your crew for almost an entire day like you might see them in the morning mm -hmm. and then maybe that night but you yep. could easily go 12 or 18 yep. hours without seeing your yep. crew yeah yep huh it's remarkable how well you did to be, to be able to pull off the two 200 so short or with such short amount of time in between each other. When you, it sounds like your recovery in the past has been, you've taken good care of yourself. I'm curious, was there anything different about recovering after Tahoe or how's, how has it been the last couple of weeks? Uh, I actually feel really good now. Um, I think uh, it was last week I got back into the gym and okay. started lifting and this past weekend went for a five mile run and felt good i went for another run last night and felt okay mm -hmm. and i think i am just gonna gradually you know just gradually sprinkle it in there as i'm feeling okay if if i allow myself to get out there and, and maybe put on some slower easy miles i don't really have any plans in maybe for the summer to implement any speed stuff i don't really think i don't have anything on my calendar right now i'm not in a massive rush to just jump back in mm. full bore but the just doing 30 minutes of lifting every try to do it monday to friday is my is my goal and then get the miles in when i can as long as as long as everything else is going good i've been up on my sleep haven't been straining myself too much that way i think <laughs> just yeah trying to be kind to myself i think that i earned it yeah, a little bit for sure. so it 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 does feel different now to where i don't think you know i i, I kind of hit what i set out to do but now i don't really feel like that was the top i don't mm. think that's it's it's not like it's not like where I just said, hey, I'm setting out on this journey to run 200 miles, and after I hit that, I'm just going to be done. It's I'm too enamored with the whole ultra community and just seeing my friends and meeting new people, going different places, just doing kind of extraordinary things relative to whatever you want to call it, to I'm just i want to do all the races that i can if i didn't have to work that would probably be what i'd be doing <laughs> i'd be floating around and running 50ks and doing all that stuff every weekend instead of doing a couple races a year but yeah i think just i'm i told myself towards the end of tahoe i said you're gonna stay off ultra sign up for at least two months <laughs> like we're not going on there. I've been on there. I've been looking. I'm not pulling the trigger on anything. The credit card's hidden away, so we're just going to sit back. But I I do think maybe I might like to attempt to go a little quicker, a little faster. I have yet to do a sub-2400 miler, so I think that kind of might be my next okay. thing yeah. that I'm going to maybe gear up to do and then that'll be i'll change my training i'll have to re readjust reevaluate and i don't really know where i'm at if i'm if i feel like i'm ready for a coach if i would i just don't want to i feel like i might be a burden to the coach to where i if, if it was on the plan i would do it uh -huh. but potentially to my detriment i just the way that my life is and how my schedule is it i find it really hard to have if i had like a structured a structured plan i'm really busy in the summers i when i'm not at my day job i work on the family farm here so we're super busy 
in the spring the middle of the summer the end of the summer with harvest it's that's when all the racing is happening and it's also when i'm super busy so it's it's a weird thing to balance and i I don't really know how i'm gonna do that in the future but i'm gonna pivot and work around it the best that i can because i really don't see myself letting up a whole lot anytime soon i would just like to progress honestly so just keep stacking the gains make your little improvements and just whenever if i am lucky enough to get an email to have an offer to sign up for cocodona next year then that would be that that would be plan a i would just start gearing up for that i'll know in 11 months or whatever if i'm not in it then i'll be planning on doing it the next year so it's i'm already thinking kind of a couple years out that that helps me like with the keeping disciplined. Well, it's been an extraordinary journey. And the, and the fact that you had a little bit of an idea where you wanted to get even from early on in the trip, I mean, learning about hundreds and thinking, oh, yeah, eventually 200s and then working towards it and setting up the block of 100 milers so that you can get ready for this and then doing 200, doing the two 200s. I, I would imagine the version of you who was getting ready for the 50K would probably be pretty impressed with you today and what you've been able to achieve. Yeah, I would like to think so. I think I've been blessed. I haven't I haven't experienced any major derailments, just the standard stuff, little injuries here and there, nothing catastrophic. I haven't I haven't had any massive issues in races. I haven't DNF'd anything yet. And I think that's maybe maybe just a, a little bit of luck, mm-hmm. but still some part of some part of me preparation has has assisted in that yeah and the knowledge base it's there that i think that really helps i try now to uh to do what i can to maybe help out people that are getting into it i have one of one of my good friends he is running his first hundred miler next month oh cool and i'll be volunteering at an aid station it's a 50 mile out and back and he'll see me at mile call it like 15 and then again at 90 or something like that it's a little over 100 i think it's 12 or something like that that he's asking me questions i'm doing my best to offer up any type of information and then that's like the the least that i can do Mm -hmm. offering help to people if somebody sends me a question on like instagram or dm on facebook or something like that like i get questions from friends that are hey how how did you prepare for this or how can i do this it's any anything that i could do to help you cross the finish line i think is i'm totally willing short of carrying you there like i'll do whatever i can to help you get there you made the comment earlier about how much the community means to you and so I think it's quite important that if you love this community that you contribute back to it and help out those who are getting started. That's quite good. I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's been quite cool listening to your tale of how you've got here. Before we turn it off, do you have any, is there anything else we haven't talked about that you'd like to share with the audience before we say goodbye? Yeah, I think if, if I'm talking to you as a, uh, a beginner and you don't think that you can do it, I'm here to tell you that you definitely can do it. I think if I'm if I can get there in the amount of time that it took me to get that first 50k, it's it's not about your it's not about your chip time. It's just about getting out there, get to that start line and then just do whatever you can to reach the finish line. I wholeheartedly believe that busy people that you've got kids you've got jobs you've got stressful jobs you've got blue collar work i think that you can do it you might not think that you can but i'm here to i'm proof that you can do it proof that hard work and just managing a schedule even but even like you said early on though you said at the very beginning that sometimes you you're the running isn't the job sometimes you have to fit running around the rest of your life and that sort of real life choices about sometimes maybe you don't run as far one day because you're busy that doesn't derail your end goal you can still get it all done yeah Yeah, absolutely i think you're as long as you're doing the work and that's different for everybody two hours of running for me is a lot less than it is for some people and it's also a lot more for me than it is for some other people. So, you know, 
an hour here, an hour there, it all adds up in the end. So it's just, you know, doing what you can with the time that you have, I think is enough. I, I really do. I think I'm not able to devote more time to training now than I was able to when I started out. It's still about the same. It's maybe less. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. I think that if you're intentional with your time and honest with yourself and you set goals and have a plan to achieve the goal, I think that you can achieve the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's super inspiring. Thanks a lot for coming on to, to share your story and for inspiring the, uh, the rest of the world with what you're doing. I look forward to yeah. seeing what you do sign up for next. Part of me really hopes you get into Cocodona so I can see you Black Canyon City next spring. I, I hope <laughs> I've got my fingers crossed that I'll get back into it too. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, yeah. Wes. Really great to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elliot, for coming on and sharing your story. It was great to see you again, and I really enjoyed our conversation. If you have recently finished your first ultra or recently completed a major new distance and want to share your story here in this series, go to honoredendurance.com and click on Ultra Origins at the top of the page. Thank you for watching. I look forward to sharing more Ultra Origin stories with you. Bye-bye.